Hi everyone, Howard Bloom's part six has been released by Airmail uh, Through the Eyes of a Killer in Cold Blood, which is his book that he's writing on the case. This is really eye-opening. We really do need to discuss this. Okay, so this part is through the eyes, really, of Steve Gonzalez, or that's who Howard Bloom is focusing on, and it's the journey that Steve has been on and is still on, um, and how he became to investigate the case himself. Uh, it starts off sort of talking about um, Kaylee and her interest in true crime and how she's sort of contacted police about the lady she saw in Walmart. And he'd remembered that and thought, you know what, I'm going to do what Kaylee did. I'm going to become my own detective in her story. I've got to do something. So that's how he discovered Chronicles of Olivia and um, sat down with uh, Christy and Olivia with Olivia um, and conducted they they sat and talked about the case and the family um, and then from there um, the article goes on to tell us about what Steve has discovered uh, who's been talking and fake news that he's been fed um, we sense uh, Steve's frustrations. He says there's some crazy people out there who just feel the need to feed us fake information. And that is so sick, isn't it? I mean, this, these families are going through absolute hell and people think it's, you know, just great fun to feed them a load of rubbish. Um, or are they people who are trying to sort of steer them away or towards a particular narrative? There is that angle to look at too. Now, before we look at what Steve has discovered, um, he does talk about Jack de Kerr um, and that how he didn't just accept that he was innocent straight away and that he'd made him, you know, lift up his shirt and roll up his sleeves and and felt that um, after a little while he felt he could trust him again. I suppose everybody's going to be a suspect, aren't they? You're automatically going to think... It's the boyfriend or somebody close to the victims. Um, he mentions Hunter Johnson as well. Hunter Johnson, he confirms in this that it was Hunter Johnson that um, discovered the scenes. Uh, he asked Hunter Johnson to tell him what he saw. He describes how Hunter had told him very matter-of-factly what he'd seen, and at the end of it, both men burst into tears. That's that's really sad to read. Um, so, yeah, I think that can be confirmed according to this article. So after the interview with Chronicles of Olivia, um, you know, we've got, we've since had the arrest, haven't we? Coburgers in jail. It says that... Um, Steve is more and more convinced that Coburg is involved, but he seems to think there might be others, which is why he is continuing to investigate. Now, he does say that, you know, despite the fact he has been fed fake information, he seems to have some faith in some of the people who are talking to him. He goes on to say there's an FBI agent in the St. Louis office um, who has given Steve his own personal email address so that it's not found out that the FBI are leaking things to Steve. So, you know, I think Steve's being very trusting. This is either completely legit and, you know, these people are feeding Steve things because they feel sorry for him and they think perhaps as, his fa as the father he has the right to know. Or is someone steering an investigation in a certain way? I mean, we have had this article telling us, you know, that Steve has been disappointed with fakes and and falsities that have been fed him. But he's got this FBI agent and a couple of other law enforcements, allegedly, who are drip feeding him information. Now, it says here as well that Members of the grand jury, this I find absolutely staggering, have been talking. So, uh, basically, it's somebody has been talking to members of the grand jury who have been opening their mouths, and that person has then gone back to Steve and told him what they've said. I just can't believe that this is going on. 
Now, according to this, you know, if this is to be believed, um, Koberger had purchased a dark blue Dickies long-sleeved work uniform at the Walmart in Pullman, Washington, not long before the murders. So, Steve um, has learnt that the authorities had a copy of the receipt. Now, we knew they had a Dickies receipt. I don't think we knew what it was for, though. Um, but they can't find the work outfit. Now, if this is true, that does ring alarm bells for me. You know, if the outfit was still there and had no DNA on it or anything, I would think, well, you know, he used it for something or, you know, it's still there. He's not hiding anything. But if he's got a receipt for this... Where's the outfit? But also, I question, why would he keep the receipt? You know, is it is he really this stupid? Maybe we are looking at a criminal who is this dumb, are we? So, you know, quick recap. He drives his car around and around town. He's obviously got his new Dickies work suit on for the occasion. He's brought his cell phone. I'm not sure who he's going to phone. If he's been stalking them, he doesn't need Google Maps on his phone. Um, and the, apparently they've got a receipt for a K-bar knife that he purchased months before the murders too. But if they've got a receipt for the knife, why are they still wanting to know what his clicks on Amazon are? Why do they need more receipts? Don't they need the weapon? I don't get that. I don't quite understand it. If they've got a receipt for a K-bar, why are they continuing to check out Amazon? And what are they looking for? They need the weapon, not another receipt. Unless, unless the K-bar he bought Maybe that knife doesn't match the injuries on the victims or some of the injuries. Maybe there was a different weapon used on another victim. Something not quite gelling with that. Um, so I don't know what you think about this work suit and whether you think that is correct or not. But that does make me question why he'd want, you know, one of these work suits that then vanishes now i have had boyfriend in the past we went to a halloween party he bought one of those um to where he wanted to be jason in friday the 13th so he bought the mask and just wore a navy boiler suit um but he didn't then discard the suit so i'd like to know your thoughts on that so this is what steve has found out but the big thing is that members of this grand jury are talking We've also got Steve's thoughts, according to Bloom, on Dylan and Bethany not doing anything. Um, I'm going to read this bit out to you. Um, Even more troubling, if true, was what Steve had learned from people who had spoken to members of the grand jury who had been presented with the prosecution's case. It centred on the alleged behaviour of the two roommates who had miraculously survived the night unscathed. How, he wondered, could they have slept blissfully unaware through the savage pre-dawn stabbing murders of four people in a narrow house with paper-thin walls? So he then describes what Dylan says in the uh, affidavit. And then it says, yet Steve had been told that the two survivors allegedly had not only been awake while the killings had taken place, but that they had heard everything. More astonishingly, his grand jury sources alleged that the two girls had been texting one another as the murderer methodically went from one room to the next. So we have grand jury sources now. OK, um... Now, this says, this all of this flaws, Steve. He doesn't understand how they're texting each other and then they still wait eight hours before calling 911. Um, he then um, says that he realised he mu- that the government must have a protected source, an informant who could provide testimony that would tighten the screws that held together the case against Koberger. Steve was determined to talk to them. He did not want to wait for the trial to get the knowledge he needed. He needed relief now. After some digging, he grew convinced he had the informant in his sights. Right, how? If this witness is protected, this informant is protected, how does Steve find out who it is? 
This intrigues me. Now, he was stopped in his tracks by the FBI. It says here, before he could make his move, he was unexpectedly stopped in his tracks by the FBI. The Bureau sent an official letter to Shannon Gray warning that if there were any attempt to contact the individual, there would be legal consequences. And it basically said, just because you are one of the victim's fathers, this does not absolve you from, you know, doing the wrong thing. You you will face the consequences because this witness has been promised, um, you know, you can come forward and we will protect you. So who is this witness? It seems if the FBI had to step in, that Steve must have got it right because he got, um, it says here, basically an intimidating warning from the FBI. Hmm. A little bit like um, they paid another witness a visit, didn't they? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on here. It's all really creepy, in my opinion. I can't work out whether, you know, this is all really secretive and hush-hush and there are genuine witnesses who have got proper information on Coburger or... Is this all shrouded in secrecy because their their uh, narrative has to be protected? I just don't know. And the other thing that comes up um, in this is the drugs issue. How Steve is pretty much what was said in the forty eight hours episode. You know, he said, God, if the kids wanted to buy marijuana, there's a shop eight miles away. They could just buy it. Christy went with them to check it out. Um, and this is really fascinating to me. He says no professional would go into that house with extra cars there. They would be put off by the fact there were cars there that they didn't know. How do you get your head around that? I, How would an unprofessional deal with that? I'm I'm kind of thinking opposite to Steve. I this tells me there had to be enough of them to deal with this this crime to get on with it. I don't think there was one person. I've made my mind up on that. But I don't understand his thinking. No pro would go in there with a car they didn't know, Kaylee's, and apparently Ethan's. But he doesn't know who the pro was after. What if the pro was after Kaylee? I knew Kaylee had a new car. How does he know Kaylee wasn't followed? How does he know there wasn't a few of them who didn't care who was in the house? But how can he state that a pro would be put off where someone like Koberger, who allegedly hasn't done anything like this before, who allegedly has been stalking the house and thinks that there are X amount of people in there, surely he's also going to be put off by these vehicles. And this car's been driving around town. He has not sat still to watch what's been going on and who's been going in and out of the house. Doesn't make sense to me. And there's also a big mistake in this article. It says that Steve has said, it's either Steve has made the mistake or Bloom has. Steve says there's normally only three girls in that house. Kaylee had moved out and Ethan wasn't always there, but he's wrong. There were four. Even as Kaylee wasn't there, there were four girls left. There was Zanna, Dylan, Bethany and Maddie still in the house. So that's wrong in this article as well. I don't I don't quite understand where that's come from. Um, so there we have it. This is Howard Bloom's part six, which, you know, the biggest thing for me is that the grand jury are talking, allegedly. Um, Steve is adamant that, you know, there's no drugs involved. I, I'm sorry, he's wrong. There are drugs involved in that house. Because Zana's mother and Maddie's stepmother and Maddie's father have been involved in drugs. There's a link. He's still making out, you know, like the 48 Hours episode, he, he's still making out this is far-fetched, Hollywood. They could go and buy marijuana, you know. But what if it's more than marijuana? I don't believe anyone got killed for, over pot. There are class A's everywhere these days they are everywhere they are party drugs they are rec recreational drugs it's big business i don't believe that all these fentanyl deaths are because people have had a dodgy doobie it's bigger stuff now i'm not saying that 
you know, nobody's confirmed anything to do with drugs was in that house. In fact, he does go on to say that the autopsy results um, basically said that all four victims had no drugs in their system. But it does not mean there was not a link to drugs in that house. Were Dylan and Bethany tested for drugs? And also, because you're a dealer doesn't mean you take drugs yourself. It's not always the case. It might have absolutely nothing to do with drugs, but I don't think you can make a sweeping statement like that. Did Steve know Zanna very well? Did he know Dylan, Bethany very well? How well did he know Ethan? I don't believe that... I'm I'm not sure, let's put it that way, that anyone was dealing in that house, but I do not think you can just write it off. I don't think you can write it off. So that is the Bloom article. It's packed full of stuff. Um... We have to sort of wonder whether Steve's um, sources, whether these sources are telling the truth when he claims others haven't been. Um, Grand jury people opening their mouths when they shouldn't be. This case is a mess, in my opinion. And I don't quite understand how this trial is ever going to be fair. I just don't. You've got two people writing books, probably more that we haven't heard about. We've got Bloom and someone else. Um, and yet everything's so secretive. There's all these leaks and all this information, you know. And how do we know what's true and what isn't? My heart goes out to all of the victims' families. I I can imagine the torment that Steve's going through, trying to be his own detective and hitting brick walls. Um, But the reality is we're not going to know till the trial. And I think he sort of... I don't know how far he's going to get with this. And I don't know how the information he's getting has been verified. Well, let me know your thoughts. Um, I will speak to you soon. I'm afraid that the alien visit tomorrow has to be postponed because my car has broken down now. So I can't go out on location, but it's only a small issue. I've got a hole in my hose. I've got water leaking everywhere, but I'm hoping it will be fixed by next weekend. So we'll do an alien location spooky Sunday next week. I would love to know your thoughts on this article. Uh, Thank you so much for watching and I will speak to you soon. Bye. Swear I won't forget this Why do I regret this? In my mind reckless Thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless Anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless Betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open I hate being broken I feel like an ocean Filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion Rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking Reopen the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost now Never at home, need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go Till I